I am very happy to be with you tonight, and uh, I hope that our time together will be productive. It's always a blessing for me to be here. The word is forgiveness. And I was thinking about it, and there's a lot of routes I could go with this topic. I, I could get up here and tell you uh, some pretty neat illustrations that I've come across on the subject of forgiveness. Let me give you give me a couple of them. Uh, one of them it says, uh, there's a Spanish story of a father and son who had become estranged. The son ran away and the father set off to find him. He searched for months to no avail. Finally, in a last desperate effort to find him, the, pa- the father put an ad in a Madrid newspaper. The ad read, Dear son, meet me in front of this newspaper office at noon on Saturday. All is forgiven. I love you, your father. On Saturday 800 sons showed up looking for forgiveness and love from their fathers. I could have told you that, but I don't think I'm going to. Or I could have told you about about our great need. If our greatest need had been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need had been pleasure, God would have sent us an entertainer. But our greatest need was forgiveness. So God sent us a Savior. I could have told you tonight about Matthew chapter 18. I think Matthew chapter 18 is a, is a powerful uh, illustration of just what the significance of forgiveness really is because it paints for us the picture of a father's forgiving spirit while at the same time, referencing our challenges on a regular basis to be people who are willing to forgive. That that passage reads, the king wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. Now the reference in Matthew chapter 18 to a man who owed 10,000 talents to a master represents for us a figure that you could live multiple lifetimes and you still wouldn't be able to repay. It was basically an impossible debt that was begged and that was forgiven. That same man, that same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, roughly a hundred days of work. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him. And he would not. But went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. A hundred denarii. Tough but doable. 
And yet the same one who had been forgiven the impossible was not willing to forgive the possible. Or I could tell you about John 8. I could tell you about one of our great struggles as humans. I could tell you from John chapter 8 that a woman was brought into the midst where Jesus was who had been caught in the act of adultery. And I could tell you about the fact that Jesus was teaching and many people were listening to him as this woman who had been caught in the act of adultery was brought in by a crowd of, well, religious people. They brought her and cast her into the midst. And in their eyes, she represented nothing more than a piece of meat. She was a means to an end. She was a token figure to where she would they would be able to make an accusation against Jesus. And in their minds, they had separated themselves so much from her. Her sin so much greater than anything they could imagine them ever having done. And so they spoke of her in very distasteful language. Speaking of an impending doom that she, that she deserved. And all the while their intention was to put Jesus in a compromising position. So that whatever he said, they'd be able to make an accusation against him. And, and, and I figure, by the way, this is my opinion, you're entitled to yours, but I, I figure John chapter 8 is one of those times where Jesus was really pushed. I was talking to someone recently and I, you know, and I made the comment, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know that, that when I get to, to heaven, I don't know that when I get to eternity, it'll still be a big deal to me. But as of right now, I have in my mind, given the opportunity, I would really like to ask and I would really like to know when was Jesus the closest? When was he pushed the most? And I will not be surprised if I find out that John chapter 8 was one of those moments where he was pushed pretty close. The Bible talks about the fact that, that he stooped down and wrote on the ground as though he didn't hear these religious leaders. And after a while, he stood and said these words that basically brought that crowd to their knees. And there's a reason this account is in your Bible for us to understand the message for us when he said, he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her first. Translation, if you're not guilty of sin, go ahead and pick up a rock and throw it at her. And I mean, they, they disappeared. From the eldest on down, they, they, they left the room because they'd been brought to their knees with this reality. We're all on pretty level ground. And we're all in need of forgiveness. 
I could have talked about that. But I don't think I'm going to. I think what I've decided I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you about me. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my history. And I hope when you learn a little bit about my history that maybe it'll give you a point or two of consideration for your own selves. You see, uh, forgiveness has not always been a big deal subject for me. Genesis chapter 2 reminds us that Clark, well, you too, into our nostrils God breathed the breath of life and we became a living soul. I, you, were created eternal. This, 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 this life is not an ending. In fact, it's really just a beginning. And we're going to be somewhere forever. We're different. It kind of bothers me when, when people make this statement. Well, we can't be perfect. I don't, I don't think that's right. I think when God breathed into my nostrils the breath of life and I became a living soul and I had this shot at life on this earth, I absolutely am convinced I could have been perfect. I could have been. You see, the truth is, if I take away the possibility that I could have been perfect, then I have to also admit I am sinning outside of my control. And that's not biblical, and that's not accurate, and that's not true to my story. Every time I've sinned, It's been my fault. Every sin of omission, commission, every, I, I, to be honest with you, I can't really remember the first one. But I know since the first one, there's been a bunch. And every single one of them has been my fault. I did it. I'm responsible. I know that I know that Romans chapter 3 speaks of the fact that that all have sinned and and fallen short of the glory of God. It's an unusual passage it is. Because in that short little passage in the book of Romans, we're reminded of just how big God is and how much God knows. I'm absolutely convicted that Romans 3 is true in what it says. And yet at the same time, those words were shared in Scripture long before I was ever on the scene. And while it's a true statement that I was going to sin, I still never did it one time outside of my own control. But the moment I sinned, my whole reality changed. For my destiny to be what I would want it to be, it left my control. And I became dependent. Dependent on another. And my great need became forgiveness. Because I had a blot 
that I couldn't do anything about. And as an image being created in the image of God, that into my nostrils God had breathed the breath of life, and I became a living soul. And, and when, I, when I transgressed, when I sinned, From my perspective, my destiny was sealed. And for there to be any way for that sin to be blotted out, washed away, I became dependent on another. Couldn't be just anybody. Couldn't be just a good guy. Had to be a, a being for me to have forgiveness. It had to be perfection. Now I want to tell you about a couple of verses tonight. One of them is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. Very personal. But Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says concerning that being he was tempted in all manner as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 4 is a retro passage. Hebrews 4 references a time that has already happened. Tempted in all manner as we are yet without sin. Victorious, church established, perfection happened. How about this one? Clark's got a shot. Tempted in all manner as we are, yet without sin. John 1 is different. John 1, 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is a precursor to a life to be lived. Hebrews 4.15 has already happened. Tempted like we are, did not sin. John chapter 1, well, just don't know. I'm going to tell you something that might shock you, but I'm convinced it's true. I'm convinced there's a moment in history that happened Somewhere between John 1, 13 and John 1, 14, when the Son of God left that place where God is to come here with the real possibility He doesn't get back. How about that? If you believe if you believe that he's tempted in all manner as we are, yet without sin, then you have to believe he could have done it. You have to believe that as he was tempted, there is a possibility that that one who's coming in to cover for you and for me could have sinned. Otherwise, it would not be temptation. Otherwise, he would not understand or relate to what our experiences are like. He was tempted, he was pushed, and he could have done it. And so he lived every accountable day with my destiny hanging in the balance. He sins one time. He gives in to temptation one time. I'm done. He's covering my hope for forgiveness every day. Could it have been Matthew 4? When he'd fasted for 40 days and nights and the, and the enemy attacks him very specifically. 
Could that have been the time that he was pushed the most with my soul hanging in the balance? With my destiny hanging out there? Don't you appreciate that every single time he responded by saying, it is written. And he overcame every temptation that came his way in Matthew chapter 4. If you don't think it was a big deal, if you don't think he was pushed, then you look to the end of that context where it says, the enemy left him and angels came and ministered to Jesus. Why did he need the support? Why did he need the ministry? Why did he need a shoulder? How close was he? How pushed was he? With your hope for forgiveness completely in his every day. I, I, I don't want to come across at all like I have any level of a lack of appreciation for Jesus going to Calvary. I, for the price that He paid on the cross, I, I, I hope I don't come across at all like I don't have the proper respect for that. But I will say this. It was His everyday victories that made it possible that He could pay that price for us at Calvary. If He doesn't get through Matthew 4, if He doesn't get through John 8, the cross doesn't mean that much. What about Matthew 26? I, man, you talk about a tough passage. Matthew 26 will push you let me tell you some of the language you'll find there. One of the things you'll find in Matthew 26 is these words coming from Jesus concerning Simon Peter. They're in this really religious environment and they've been in the upper room and everything that goes along with that and, and Simon Peter's making this bold promise I'll never leave your side. No matter what happens to you, I'm right there with you unto the end. I'm right there. If I have to go to prison, if I die, I'm not going to ever leave your side. And it was in Matthew 26 that Jesus said to Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny three times that you know me. And, and, and Simon, Simon Peter, he couldn't believe it. That's not true. I, I, I'm, I'm there with you all the way. And Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny. Do you even know me? Here's, here's kind of an unusual event. On the heels of Jesus saying that, they make their way toward the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is struggling. I mean, he's struggling. He's in despair. He's having a hard time and he goes into the garden of Gethsemane and he specifically requests for Peter, James, and John to go with him deep into the garden where he's going to pour his soul out to them. And my, my question for you tonight here at 6th Avenue is in what condition must you be in for you to identify a man who in a short period of time is going to deny that he even knows you. Why do you want him with you at arguably the hardest time in your entire life? How desperate was Jesus for support? How desperate was he for a shoulder to lean on? How desperate was he for somebody, even if that somebody was a guy that was about to deny him? And how about this? You remember these words? Father, if it's possible, 
Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. How about this? He didn't want to do it. If there's any other way, he didn't want to do it. Now I want to ask you tonight, as we prepare to close, I want to ask you tonight, when you think about the fact that Jesus wanted to carry Simon Peter with him deep into the garden. And when you think about Jesus saying, I mean saying, if it's possible, remove this cup from me, I don't want to do it. Does that make you think less of him? Or more? I'll just tell you my perspective my perspective of him skyrockets. To know he loves me and wants me to be forgiven on such a level that he will pay that kind of price even when it's hard, even when he's pushed, even when it's not what he wanted to do. It makes my view of him skyrocket. Brother Levi was talking about beautiful words. I actually believe one of the most significant words in the entire Bible is the word nevertheless. When he said nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, that's Jesus saying, hey, it's not about what I want. It's not about me. It's about fulfilling the will of the Father. Wouldn't this world be a better place if more of us were committed to doing the will of the Father whether we wanted to or not? Forgiveness. It is possible for me to be presented white as snow without blemish to my Father on that day of judgment, presented by the bridegroom himself, who paid the price so that I would have the shot through my obedience and commitment for forgiveness. What I ask you tonight when such a grand price has been paid for you to have a shot at being forgiven, how could we help but live a life where we demonstrate forgiveness toward other people? What level of forgiveness would you ever have to render that would ever even come close to the immeasurable forgiveness that has been extended to us. It is a blessing for us to be able to stand in a room like this and sing what we call a a song of encouragement where individuals are reminded of the opportunity that is present to be baptized for the remission of their sins, to be restored to the church after having fallen away, to just ask the prayers of this good group of people, to always have in front of us the reminder of this grand need that all of us have to be forgiven, and to think of the magnanimous price that's been paid so that that abundant gift is possible. Forgiven, forgiving. That's my blessing. And that's my task. As together we stand.